What's the secret to a happy marriage? And how can couples, communities, and parishes help build stronger marriages? Today, we'll talk about these questions and more with our special guest, Father Jay Donahue, a priest of the Diocese of Pittsburgh and the founder of Renew the I Do. I'm Michael Hernan, Vice President of Strategic Relations at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Michael Hernan, Vice President of Strategic Relations here at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. Um, we're going to be talking about marriage today. I'm joined in our studios with our regular panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, uh, Professor of Systematic Theology here at Franciscan, and Dr. Scott Hahn, who holds the Father Michael Scanlon Chair in Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization, again here at Franciscan. And we're pleased to welcome Father Jay Donahue, uh, a, a priest of the Diocese of Pittsburgh. You uh, studied at the University University of Virginia, uh, as well as then you went on to Rome uh, and, and studied there as well. Uh, you were ordained in 2006. Correct. And you are the pastor at, at uh, St. Simon and Jude, right? And But you, you're also the, uh, the founder of the Renew I Do Foundation, uh, which will be the topic of our show today about marriage. But before we talk about that, I'd love to just talk a little bit about you. Um, I know the Donahue family. Mm. It's a little bit bigger than just one priest. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's more of a clan. It's right. <laughs> and, I always like to say it's kind of a small family. My yeah. grandparents only had 13 kids. Only 13. And, yeah. and from that, there's now 84 grandchildren. Oh my I'm goodness. the oldest <laughs> grandson, <laughs> and my consecrated sister's the oldest grandchild of the clan. And now there's 112 uh, 12, uh, great-grandchildren. Yeah. So the over-under is 250 on the great-grandchildren. <laughs> oh, yeah. I call it the 13th tribe of Israel. Like, That's right. It's not a I guess it really does tribe. take a village. Yeah. <laughs> they own the village. Yeah. yeah, right. But what's so inspiring about that was just my grandparents parents, their vision of wanting to have a big family, their vision of growing up just after World War II, and really recognizing that their marriage could inspire a family that is such growing in so many ways. It's so beautiful. It, it really, I believe it is part of God's plan that there is a world conquest through families. So you guys are taking that seriously. <laughs> you know, my grandfather, he just passed uh, last year, and one of the things that was on his lips as he was dying was he looked up at his dear bride of 70 years, and he mm. says, you are beautiful. Mm. And then he right? says, I yeah. love you. Yeah. He's praying the divine chaplet. It's a Friday at three o'clock, and that's when he passes. How beautiful. And oh to me, that's goodness. really what marriage is right. all about. It's yeah. you know, the two spouses coming together and saying, yeah. We're on a journey to heaven. Let's just be open to God's prayer. Yeah, and then when he opens his eyes on the other side, there's his mother in heaven who is even more radiant oh. yeah, than his bride. Mm. And then being a priest to witness that, Gosh, uh, my dear yeah. grandmother allowed wow. me to come down and celebrate Mass. Hmm. Right as he, he had passed, and so as I lift up the body of Christ, I see the body of my dear grandfather who inspired me to be a priest, and just no. thank God for no. a healthy marriage like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Knowing some of your uh, your relations in that mm -hmm. large family, uh, it is it is rich uh, with the faith, rich with a, a legacy that your your, right. your grandparents started. That is is beautiful to see, which is really it is the plan. It, it is, is. The, but but we're not currently living in that same state of affairs in the United States of America today. No, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> how would you summarize the, the kind of the state of marriage in the United States of America today? Well, I think that one of the things about the state of marriage, when you talk about marriage at all, and the reason why I even wanted to start a foundation, mm. is that there's so much joy and grace that comes from God to married couples. Mm. And so to me, the state of marriage is underrated. It's like there is just this tremendous force that God blesses a couple yes. when you are plugged into the sacrament of yeah. marriage. And so definitely there are statistics about the divorce rate and the decline of couples that actually want to get married. But when couples come together to prepare for marriage, they think, what scriptures are we going to be living by? Mm. What co how is this covenant bond going to be worked out? All of a sudden, this flow of grace comes into their hearts. Mm. And that transformative element at the most domestic, you know, the domestic side of the church is absolutely incredible. So to me, marriage is underrated hmm. because there's so much grace that's just untapped right there mm. when, 
when the bride and the groom come together and exchange those vows, it's not just a vow, it's an oath. And then they tap into this great power of God and you're just like, okay, let's hold on for the ride because <laughs> when you see it lived out, it's just incredible the yeah. amount of power that they are plugging into. And so, but, but Father, yeah. how do you answer the skeptic? Because I mean, this is wildly optimistic. This is Hallmark greeting card stuff. Right, well, I'm a pastor and you yeah. know, most- I mean, you know, Eliot talks about the gap between the idea and its execution. Right. And there falls the shadow. I mean, marriage is under a shadow, a cloud of confusion and just bloody chaos. We can't even agree on what it means right. to be married. You can yeah. marry anybody. Absolutely. And, you know, T.S. Eliot says, we had the experience, but do we grasp the meaning? Yeah, we missed the meaning. And, yeah. and that's what I think is happening yeah. now, is that we have this beautiful sacrament, and we're, we're worried about what the cake's going to look like if the music right. is set up right, yeah. and if we have the right dress on. Yes. Yeah. And so as I sit down with you know these couples that want to get married, I said, well, let's unpack what God's grace is going to do for you, with you, and in cooperation in this love, and not miss right. the meaning, right. because they're all in for the experience. And that, okay. in, in and of itself, is probably why in some sense, uh, the state of marriage is absolutely under siege. The state of marriage overall, there's less couples getting married. I, I think that part of the problem is that marriage has become somewhat incomprehensible right. to the millennials yes. and to others as well. I mean, right. I remember yeah. reading Professor Carl Zimmerman's classic, Family and Civilization, when he was professor of family sociology at Harvard back in the 40s and 50s, defending marriage and family. He was looking at ancient Rome and showing how marriage was a sacramentum, at least mm -hmm. ideally, but also legally. And it, was just the, the, it wasn't just a part of the society, it really was sort of the most influential principle for the society. Now, Romans fell far short of that ideal, obviously, right. but it just struck me that in our time, it isn't a structure and principle for our society, it's sort of an anomaly. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like everything else in our society is left up to the individual, to my free choice, to what I experience, and how I can come and go as I please, and then suddenly these marriage bonds prove to be bondage. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is something that is incomprehensible how the church would expect people to do today what practically everybody strove to do for yeah. the last it, it, you know, it, It's almost as if the catechesis that cries out to be imparted has to be a catechesis about nature before we can engage grace. I mean, there's a sense in which the natural institution of marriage and, and family is the greatest revelational event in nature, in the cosmos, and people don't get it. They're now clueless about it. I mean, how do you restore a kind of sanity before nature? the way things are, the givenness of being, the complementarity of the two sexes. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be Adam and Eve, but right. nowadays it's Adam and Steve, or maybe, you know, Adam and his pet dog, Fido. Any connection works. Correct, and there's such a struggle in humanity to find love and to, to feel loved and to experience love. But if we do it in Christ, and that's what I think sets apart the Christian perspective, the that's Catholic right. proposal to marriage, if you will, is Christ's role in marriage. Yeah. And the way you restore humanity is by seeing it through Christ. And so yeah. I think that our nature, obviously, through grace is what will be able to be the successful way to live marriage out. You know, a decade ago when uh, the, the Synod on the New Evangelization was convened, mm -hmm. uh, then Pope Benedict got up and gave a talk that seemed to be somewhat extemporaneous. It wasn't on the schedule. But he, he spoke about the New Evangelization and the crisis in marriage and then he kind of held the two up to each other to show how it's not a coincidence that we need to re-evangelize so many Catholics and re-catechize them with regard to marriage because the gospel is marriage and marriage is how we discover the gospel. Yes. And so Christ and his bride on the one side is the supernatural grace that enables me and my bride to live it out in the natural order. And yeah. he was basically saying, apart from Christ, we never could do it really, but now we know it, or at least we can really see it clearly. And yeah. I, I just think that this is you know, the key, because before you could keep your marriage vows through tradition, the contract, you know, custom, and the moral fiber of the land. Now, apart from Christ, Jesus says, you could do nothing. That's right. and, but with me, you can do everything. That's right. And you know, one other anecdote that I recall was, as a PhD student, still not yet Catholic, 
I was taking a course on religion and society with a Jesuit who taught in the law school and in the theology department. And Father Keefe was going on in the mid-80s about the moral majority, about Richard John Newhouse, the naked public square. And he was in the middle of the lecture and all of a sudden we saw him looking out the window and he just paused and you could tell he was interrupting himself. He said, you know, all this debate about the role of religion in society, if Catholics just lived the sacrament of matrimony for one generation, the result would be a Christian society. But I digress. And he went back to his lecture notes. Right. But none of us did. You know, we were like, what was that? That was a was bomb that, you know, that just went off. It was a hyperbole. And the more I reflected upon it, I thought, no, he nailed it. Yeah. I mean, with a laser beam insight, yeah. it's as simple as that and as difficult as that, too. He did nail it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've experienced yeah. it in my own family. And all, unfortunately, you can experience when Both. the marriages don't work out right. and how that just affects the children. And in a parish, because I'm a pastor, I've always felt church is about a family of families centered on Christ. Mm -hmm. And in my small family, it was easy to kind of envision that. Mm -hmm. But when you see how, if marriage is, if you get marriage right, then the children will come to church. It, it's amazing how it just cascades down. Yeah. And when you get marriage wrong, how the ill effects of that are what we feel in our communities today. I mean, it, it is, and you know, we've always talked about it as the building block of society, right? You know, we, we've, uh, I think it was Pope Benedict, had, at least paraphrasing him, that the family is the means and the ends of the new evangelization. Right. You know, that this is the pathway. We've seen so many studies that have talked about how the family, uh, I think it was, uh, um, Mary, that the family broke down and then religion broke down. Mm -hmm. So really, this is at the heart of, of who we are as Catholics. It's, it's our theology, it's our eschatology, it's everything. You know, and and yet as a let's bring it down to the very personal level as a pastor, mm -hmm. you're seeing this, and I think this is probably the impetus for the foundation, the the renew I do uh, foundation. What are some of the struggles? What are some of the problems you're seeing as a pastor uh, in marriages today? Well, first you see the struggles before they get married. Mm. Um, the the pure most just living together, the cohabitation, yes. the hookup culture. Those types of things are the groundwork of which marriage will get lived out later. Mm. So the first thing we try to do in terms of our marriage preparation is encourage the couples to, to separate if they're cohabitating. And it's a, it's a struggle. It's not easy. Right. But most of the couples that come to us uh, in our parishes have been living together for quite a while. And, right. and that sows the seeds to a very challenging marriage. 33% uh, of marriages uh, increase their percentage of divorce under that type of a scenario. So we, we try to pray with them and, and let them see that there's a bigger, obviously, the theology of the body is great help. But so the marriage preparation piece is extremely helpful to, to catechizing the couples and, and just trying to relate to them so that they can start the groundwork, the foundation to their marriage to be healthy. Mm. Then there are different stages that we see in marriage. Four years in, maybe they're having their first child and all of a sudden this friendship between the two of them, there's an uncomfortable or a comfortable little baby there. And we see that sometimes that's where divorce can sometimes settle in in those mm -hmm. first few years. So we tried to do more than just marriage prep. It's more, let's, we'll walk with you. We're going to pray with you. Mm -hmm. We're going to celebrate with you. We're going to cry with you. You know, just as you've taken a lifelong commitment as a church and as a parish and as your pastor, I'm committed to you as well. Mm -hmm. And so I don't take lightly the 170 marriages I've done of trying to walk with them and as yeah. a pastor to mm -hmm. reaffirm that. And then one of the hinge years in marriage I find is around the 19th or 20th year. It's just, you know, if you have a child or two, all of a sudden the kids are not needing you anymore. Yeah. And uh, there's that uncomfortable feeling of, who did I marry? It's almost like we don't have a common enemy anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, Uh-oh, here we are. Yeah. And so we find that there's a huge divorce rate right around that 19th and 20th year. And so yeah. we, uh, those types of struggles are what we want to really try to prevent. So we do a lot of preventative maintenance in marriage. And then the 35th year where it's incredible how... Uh, some struggles that happen in, in, in more of the seasoned marriages and mm. even some of the golden years, which you've never heard before, where the divorces and just the separations of the elderly and you're like, wait a second, this right. is when you should be enjoying the golden times of, you know, of your life. One thing you haven't wow. mentioned yet wow. in response to the problems is the internet Correct. and pornography. You know, uh, the millennials I referred to a few minutes ago, but there's a new group called the iGen. Right. That is the internet generation right. and those who were born from 95 on have never known life without iPads and iPods and iPhones and everything else. And they're now being described sociologically as completely the most non-religious generation that we have ever studied. 
And it strikes me that, you know, this is what's coming up. And so what we've got to do is raise the bar of the new evangelization, raise the formation. You know, this renew the I do to me is sort of like not a nice thing. It's a necessary thing. Yeah. And I think not just in one parish, but lots and lots until it's in every one. You know, uh, the point I would make is that if, if marriage, the, the grace of the sacrament, if it represents a kind of transmutative surgery, upon the human soul, mm. then it can only work if the nature that's there uh, is already sound, wholesome, mm -hmm. it would seem to me. Uh, and the internet generation strikes me as utterly denatured, utterly disconnected one from the other. They're living a kind of estrangement from their bodies, from the body of the other. They're plugged into a world of cyberspace which is simply not real. There's no real presence. Look at me. That doesn't happen uh, in these, uh, these relationships. They're not relationships. They're just sort of accidents that happen to happen. How do you catechize people like that? Like, you know, you've got a couple, this hypothetical couple. They want to get married. They're shacking up. They've been living together indefinitely. What the hell can you tell them? Uh, how, what does marriage add to what they've already got? I want you to look at that at the next segment. <laughs> Stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. When I became a father, and when I first looked upon my son, just with that joy and that love that every new dad feels, uh, for the first time in my life ever, I felt the father's love in a real way. And I saw that joy and that love that I was feeling. I know that the father looks at me in the same fashion. And one way having a child has enriched our marriage for me is to be able to see my husband in a new light as a father and love him. In, in a whole new way as he's been transformed by this child that we have, the fruit of our marriage. When God created you, he made you like no other person. You are unique, singular, and unrepeatable. So shouldn't your college experience be the same? At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith and reason, wisdom and grace, mercy and truth. You'll study under world-class scholars and seasoned practitioners who are committed to Christ and His Church. With over 40 majors and pre-professional programs, you'll find the formation you need to succeed. You'll discover lifelong friends and mentors who will welcome you, challenge you, and encourage you. Because we believe as Catholics, we are not called to hide from culture, but transform it. At Franciscan University, you'll find more than just a college. You'll find yourself and an educational experience as singular as you are. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking with Father Jay Dunahoo, um, who's the founder of the Re Renew the I Do uh, Foundation. Um, we had a question from Regis right on the, on the last part. Um, maybe you could start off with, uh, with that question. Yeah, it's a great question today. Most of the couples that are engaged and getting married, they're part of this millennial generation. They're part of just waking up in the morning with their iPhones, going to bed with their iPhones, and, and just being in touch with the internet world and the social media. And one of the things that I have found that is, is taking the goodness of this generation is their desire to be in relationship. Mm -hmm. Why would they connect through Facebook and Twitter? It's because they want to be connected. They want to feel connected. Okay. So if you can take that to another level of saying, well, let's start to connect with the world around us and see that there are problems of poverty. There are problems of, of different types in the society. And so let's go out and do missions. Yeah. And one of the couples that I'm thinking is actually, uh, she met her dear husband, or future husband, on a mission trip. Really? As they're great trying to, to do, <laughs> yeah, Corporal Works of Mercy is a yeah. great way to remind the human heart that I have a heart that actually can help other hearts. Yes. And so then when that starts getting channeled in a direction of, of getting involved in the church in that way, well then all of a sudden, uh, the way in which you live your life in terms of giving yourself to others isn't mm -hmm. based on what you're getting from self-satisfactory type of images on internet. But there is no doubt that pornography has become now creeping up to be more uh, of a cause for divorce than money and for other issues that have been in the past, especially amongst men. It's such a challenge for us men to not reduce women down to just some image of, uh, of, of personal, you know, Pleasure. Gratification, yeah. yeah, gratification. John Paul II used to, to talk about love and what's the opposite of love, it's not really hatred, it's lust. Mm. 
Yeah. And, yeah, and yes, I think yes. that's the education in virtue and the education in relationship that we're trying to bring the young people. But the, the problem is, is that when you, usually when a couple comes to you to get married, you have about six months to a year to prepare them. Right. Well, they've been spending 20 years in, yeah. in this environment. So you can't really solve the issue with them yeah. in 12 months. Right, you have to right. see it yep. as a long term. That's why the foundation is called Renew the I Do, because in the end, I can't think that just because they did my marriage preparation program that there's not going to be issues and they're not going to have temptations after this. Yes. It's a lot like what happens when you get ordained a priest. It's not like you get ordained a priest and now everything's perfect. Yeah. You need a spiritual director. You need your time to do your retreats. You need time to, to renew your own I do, that's right. which is my I do to Jesus Christ as the spouse in the church. So uh, that's, I think, one of the ways to, to try to, to, to guide the relationship of these couples towards each other, towards Christ, yeah. and not necessarily only by right. using Facebook. Well, in, in a way, vocations uh, uh, to marriage or the priesthood or, or anything else uh, are really the same. Uh, it requires a consecration of your whole life, your energy. Yeah. Be worthy of the flame consuming you, as Paul Claudel puts it, uh, and to harness yourself to that goal, that objective, the beloved, in whom you see a beam of the eternal thou, God himself. That requires a transfiguring self-discipline, self-mastery, and that could take a lifetime and then maybe a couple thousand years in purgatory to pull off. But it's really an exercise in humility. Mm. And that's not something you purchase uh, on the internet. You've got to get these kids to unplug disabuse them of it. Remember John Sr.'s advice. If, if you want a Christian culture, the first thing you have to do is grab the television set and just kick it out the window and start fresh. Look at the stars or look at your wife, your children. Yeah. Right, and the creative ways that I saw, like for example, my grandfather do that was to, to get a farm outside of Pittsburgh and go and make hay and uh, go out and ride horses <laughs> and play softball. Yeah, make and babies and hay. <laughs> that's a great combination. And so that was one of the things that I started to realize is that when am I happiness, happiest yeah. is when I'm in relationship mm. with my family and with God. Yeah. And I, I remember at UVA when I was studying there, yeah. I was in a fraternity life and in this whole type of atmosphere that wasn't praying rosaries, we were more draining kegs than that. And, yeah. and all of a sudden it dawned on me that I was happiest when I was authentically loved. Mm. An internet can't give you that. No, no, and people shallow. realize that. And that takes, as you say, humility to realize right. that God exists and I'm not God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I have yeah. a need for God. And it's not just at my fingertips. Well, the only yeah. wisdom we can hope to acquire, uh, Elliot says, is the wisdom of humility. And humility is endless. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's not a means to some other end. It's an end in itself. Mm. Imagine telling God, look, I've got humility now. Is there something else uh, I need to master? It, mm. It's endless. Right. Coupling humility with determination, I think, is essential, too. I, I remember when we were going through marriage prep, we were both Protestants, but we realized that we have to be determined that divorce is not an option. It's not yeah. on the table. It's, yeah. not, it's not even in the categories that we're looking at, you know? And I was talking to Kimberly about this last week uh, after, you know, almost 40 years, and she was looking back on her grandparents who were married and in love to the end, and they were also involved in politics and that sort of thing. But both of them came from divorced families. That's right. And back in the 19 teen, you know, the 19 teens, the 20s, that was just unusual. I mean, it was almost unheard of. But it was their determination when they got married. Yeah. You know, uh, they, 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 they were tempted toward despair. And naturally, people who come from broken families are. But you can also then, with humility and with God's holy grace, you can be bound and determined to not let the, and, and then get whatever help you need. And you know, in our book, Rome Sweet Home, we admit that we needed help. We went to Catholic counseling, and boy, it was really key, but it also showed us that the sacrament that we had, without even knowing we had it, was a reservoir, not just of a finite amount of water to draw from, but the infinite grace, yeah. mercy, and forgiveness to draw from. And yeah. whew, you know, yeah. our determination plus that divine grace. Yeah. Well, well Father, you have probably found this to be the case in counseling couples. They don't want to be defined by failure. Uh, they Correct. want right. their marriage right. to be a success. Yeah. Um, and it helped, I, I think, years ago in a culture where at every turn you were sustained and ratified uh, by 
that commitment. It, divorce is just not on the table. Right. It's not negotiable. And so couples were forced to try to make do, to survive, to do the best of a bad job. And they were surrounded by other couples that produced this fabric of, of wholesomeness. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm struck by Nelson Rockefeller, who back in the early 60s wanted to be president. But he left his wife, walked out on his children, and that ruined him. Uh, politically, he had no future in the GOP. I mean, he also wasn't much of a Republican, pretty squishy. But that one act, that sort of ended his career. But in those days, there was a consensus. You've got a really tough job. Yeah. It's so challenging. You're talking to couples that don't emerge from that kind of matrix. I mean, we live in a throwaway culture. Love is just a promise you make. It's not a vow. It's not binding. And if it doesn't work, you, you leave. You go elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, you, how do you overcome that? Well, I, I, even just thinking, how do we reverse that course? You know, how, yeah. do we, how do we reverse this course when you, before problems set in? You know, so, so we have this culture. We have all of this right. that, that's forcing uh, a whole new cultural milieu and, and devaluing of marriage. But right. before couples get to some problems... How do we strengthen? How do we renew the I do? How, what are you seeing? Well, what I think is is that sometimes people get to the point where they, they say, oh, I've lost the spark. Yeah. And so you say, okay, yeah. how do we not get to that point? Yeah. And one of the ways of doing that is celebrating your anniversary. Mm. To recognize after one year, this is a tremendous milestone. <laughs> and right. Two yep. years. So it's not comparing yourself to other marriages. It's yeah. to say, God has a vision for our marriage. Let's celebrate that. Yes. And study after study says frequent date nights yeah, are some yeah. of the best. But it doesn't mean you have to go to, to the opera or something official. It's enough sometimes to settle the kids down and say, let's throw away the phones and the TV, yeah. have a nice glass of wine and sit by the fireplace. Mm -hmm. In our foundation, we try to do three or four really exciting date nights, like go down to Heinz Field and watch a Steeler game. But before <laughs> that, go. We'll go out on a boat, celebrate mass, and just have a chance to renew the I do through the Eucharist and then through a good football game. Or go down to PNC Park and and, and maybe hear a, a, a stimulating talk on marriage by somebody who's been through the marriage uh, it's ringer. keeping the fire burning. Yes. yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing I think is also just surrounding yourself with, with good friends. Mm. And one of the things that I, I find which is so heart-wrenching sometimes is, is when people are giving advice of saying, you know what, you ought to just throw that marriage away and you've lost the spark, therefore you have permission to, to kind of yeah. move on and look at what's going on here. Yeah. But then when you say, but let's go back to your love map right? Yeah. and see from all eternity when you were born and your spouse were born, everything was pointing towards the sacrament of marriage. Then when you met, everything pointed towards the two of you getting married. Yeah. Because one little spark here and one little friction right. here doesn't take away the, 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 the eternal plan of God for yeah, your life. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the, the two operative faculties are mind and will, head and heart, and not the emotions. It's not glandular. It's a movement of the will. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has to be fortified by grace, by God, and by the example of other couples that, that somehow perdure despite yes. the storms. I mean, that line from Shakespeare is so telling. Love does not alter when it alteration finds. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of the tempest, uh, it, it stands steady. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be blown away by, by this emotional storm. Yeah. I mean, that has to be stressed, that, that it's not going to be uh, the honeymoon all the time. It's going to be hard and bitter agony, an uphill struggle, but it's worth it because at the end of the day, uh, you have made a saint of yourself. Yeah. What I like about the list that you just gave us is that how it, it really puts flesh in all of that grace, you know, uh, PNC Park, Heinz Field, you know, but also the river, dates, coffee, wine, whatever, you know. It just seems to me that you're also surrounding married couples with other married couples who are enjoying this and each other. So you have, you know, what Michael Manis, I think it is, calls marriage mentors, you know. That's right. And you have married couples who are modeling it, but you don't just have ideal couples who have this unattainable, right. you know, romance. And so we're always comparing ourselves and falling short and wondering if, why, if it's worth it. You, ha you have marriage mentor couples who are also... Uh, how do I say it? They have recovered. You know, yeah. they, they they've can weathered the storm. That's right. Uh -huh. And they can point to the way that you can go in order to recover the spark or whatever else. And, and that's why my wife and I actually started our little podcast that we do. That's right. You know, Messy Parenting, because mm. right. we found that there are too many couples who had this, the, even in modern day, this Pinterest.
perfect ideal right. that right. was unattainable. And they didn't realize that that marriage is in the, the, the dirty, small, simple things, but it's still profound, it's yeah. still worth it. And there is great joy to draw right. on. We've just seen that there's a hunger. There's a hunger out there for people who are longing for this because they aren't getting it on the Facebook and the Instagrams mm -hmm. and everything else. They're not finding the community they long for. And and too many times the people that we're talking to, they feel that they're, they're the only ones who are still trying to live a faithful Catholic marriage in a see. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, solution. that that sense of solidarity can be very helpful, yeah. very inspiring. The other day, my wife and I were part of a, a mass. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the bishop had this sunburst. Why not have a mass celebrating couples that are observing anniversaries? And, and we observed 35 years. I mm -hmm. thought, you know, that's pretty impressive. But then I bump into couples that have been doing it for 71 years. Yeah. That's more than twice what we've got. That That's a little daunting. That's intimidating. But it's really inspiring. Yes. It can be done. It's possible. Yeah. And here is something that we've done, and let's point with pride uh, to this accomplishment. But without the grace of God, uh, you can't do it. You're just spinning wheels, and we wouldn't have survived, you know, uh, 35 minutes. Uh, we would have found something better to do with our lives. Yeah, I, love how the, I love how the, the sacrament of marriage in the center of the liturgical rite is obviously the exchange of vows. Yeah. But on either side, it's bookended with the Word of God and the Eucharist. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, this is where we need to be uh, sustaining our vows. It's, yeah. it's not just built on my word to you. Right. Right. It's not just, you know, I got on my knees and I'm, I'm asking my dear uh, girlfriend, will you marry me? Yeah. But it's done in the name of God. It's right. done in the Word of God and the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ. And so, when that is understood and, and gone back to, let's say, let's take those scriptures that we used for our, our wedding day yeah. and make that what we kneel on. I love the one couple that we prepared, they were make, they're building their house and they went through their whole house and went into the rafters and said, this is where this scripture should go. <laughs> and so, and so we awesome. built our house on the scriptures and then right. it, by going to mass on the weekends, they activate, what's the first thing a married couple does after they exchange their vows? They receive the body and blood of Christ if they're in the Catholic Church. And, you, can you imagine a better way to begin your marriage Amen. than in, 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 in Mass oh. by receiving the Eucharist? Oh, that's great. Stay with us for the next segment on Franciscan University Presents. Now that we're 20 years married with teenagers down to seven-year-olds, um, we're at a nice phase that the children are all in school so we can attend daily Mass. So we try to start our morning with attending daily Mass together. And I find that it fills my heart with love for my husband and for my children. And one of the things that sort of changed, we usually would be able to spend time together in the evening after all the kids have gone to bed, but now with teenage sons um, around, we spend time with them. There's a little more chaotic in the house, so we don't get as much time together then, so we have to think of other ways to, to, to spend time together. So we'll meet for lunch or, or for breakfast uh, out, and that way we can still have uh, and schedule some quality time together. When it comes time to choose a university, academic excellence is a must. Because the main reason you go to a university is to be equipped to succeed at your career goals in life. NCAA sports, great college community, you know, great study abroad program, those things are pluses. But the main reason I came here myself, and I'm dropping my daughter off here, is that what you find at Franciscan University of Steubenville doesn't just equip you to succeed at your career goals, it equips you to succeed at being the person that God made you to be. The friars, the community, the prayer life, the household system, the whole, the whole life of this place. So made me the man I am today. Check out franciscan.edu today. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. This entire program springs forth actually from the very heart of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. Right now we're recording this in our communication arts studios. Our students are operating the cameras and equipment. Our, uh, our faculty are our regular panelists here on the show. Uh, we've been talking to Father Jay Donahue about marriage. And Father, we, we mentioned this in the beginning, but I, I want you to share a little bit uh, more about uh, the foundation you started, Renew the I Do Foundation. Why did you start it? We, we, we've kind of painted a picture of marriage, and so I think we, we get a, a clearer sense of why you did it, but 
Yeah, and even what before I jump in, my, my dear sister Colleen went to school here yeah, at Franciscan yes. University. And, and one of the things that she came to me with when she was discerning the vocation to marriage, because she had discerned whether she'd be consecrated or not, she came to me with her dear boyfriend, and they both had a, a great problem. One <laughs> came from more of a Benedictine spirituality, the other Franciscan, so the confluence of <laughs> the two prayer uh, styles, uh, uh, one doing the liturgy of the yes, word, the other is yes. more a spontaneous Eucharistic adoration. They say, how do we do this? How does this work? And I love that type of question because as a pastor, I know that the key to marriage is prayer, mm. is being on our knees. Mm. And one of the things that happens in the sacrament of marriage is it's the one sacrament that I don't perform, you could say, you know, yes, yeah, whereas yeah. baptism, you know, I have the words to say, or the Eucharist, but, but in a marriage situation, in the marriage sacrament, it's the husband who's the minister to the wife and the wife who's the minister to the husband. And, and so therefore, one of the things that I started to see is that when the husband is asking the wife, what should I be interceding for God for you for? Mm. And in my prayer, know exactly what is in the heart of my wife. Yeah. And then the wife turning to her husband and say, deep down, this is what I want the Lord. To, this is what mm. I need. Can you pray this for me? Right. Can you imagine how that must move the heart of God the Father? Yeah. Seeing a husband on his knees for his wife and a wife on her knees for the husband. So at the heart of it for me, it was, there's a very simple thing that hopefully Renew the I Do accomplishes, yes. which is encourages couples to pray together. Because a couple that prays together stays, stays together. together. Yeah. And so as a priest, we're, we, we have to tackle so many problems every day as a pastor. And, and what I started to calculate, the amount of time that I dedicate to the theme of marriage was maybe 5 or 10 percent because yeah. of all oh. the other things. But of that 5 or 10 percent, a lot of it was dedicated to marriage preparation sure. <laughs> or to unfortunate divorced couples going through an annulment. Yeah. Well, if you notice, there, that's not marriage ministry. Right, right. It's free and almost it's closed. Oh. Correct. Yeah. So I'm thinking, well, as a pastor, what could, what could I do to try to create an atmosphere where I would have to, <laughs> so to yeah. speak, yeah. work with married couples? And, and so one of the first things I did was I asked several couples, what can we do? to encourage uh, your marriage. So it doesn't just survive. Mm. Lots of survival techniques out there. Right. Yes, said, yeah. But how do we get your marriage to thrive? Okay, yes. And they were like, I said, well, why don't we reaffirm your vows? Yeah. So all of a sudden, 50 couples came <laughs> together in the sanctuary, right. and they looked at each other again, and said, after X amount of years, I reaffirm my love, my life, and, and I sacrifice totally for you. And it was so, it, so I was just moved by the Holy Spirit at the time. There was yeah. a priest con celebrating with me. They were both crying watching them. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, we're so surprised that awesome. that prayerful looking into the eyes of your spouse, knowing how God can play such the essential role right. mm. is what inspired me to say. Yeah, it's a, a curious conjunction. Mm. You have human passion, but you have it harnessed to prayer. Correct. Uh, and the language of, of hope is prayer, the grammar of, of hope. And the best prayer is the Our Father. But if it's contextualized in the Mass, then it's uh, somehow joined to this absolute prayer of the Son for the Father, the sacrifice that somehow changes everything, the whole dynamic. Uh, and that marriage vow takes place. It's exchanged in the setting of the Mass. Mm. And in a way, Jesus gives us his body in the Eucharist, and then when the couple celebrate uh, their sacrament, their marriage, they give each other uh, uh, their bodies, what, what Dietrich von Hildebrand beautifully calls mutual self-donation. You give everything. You surrender everything. It, it's not a contract. I, I think of Immanuel Kant, uh, that desiccated German, who, who, who describes marriage as the mutual use of one another's genitals. I mean, that's not marriage. I mean, that's like prostitution, but you're, you're doing it for free. Uh, marriage is a, is a vow, and the consecration of the couple uh, somehow inserts them into the eschaton, uh, into the life of, of glory. And every act of love is a foretaste of that glory that we hope uh, will await us on, on the other side. That's a pretty sublime uh, adventure. Right, it's not exchange of paper like a right, legal contract, right, right, it's yeah. an exchange of persons. Yeah, yeah. And so when you start to engage that with married couples, yeah. all of a sudden they're like, well, can we do more of this? Right. It's yeah, like, well, yeah. yeah, let's go through some wine testing and at yeah. the same time <laughs> have a mass. And so all of a sudden this started to just 
kind of flow into, well, why don't we do more renewals of vows? Yes. Sometimes at Mass, there would be this World Day of Marriage, which That's right. anybody stands up and you get the whammy from the priest. <laughs> it seemed impersonal, and sometimes your spouse wasn't at Mass with you. That's right. right. And so we said, well, why don't we do this just for married couples to come together mm. and, and look each other in the eyes again and reaffirm what they did 20, 30, 40, sometimes up to 70 years ago. Wow. And then we started to do the research and look at things and say, frequent date nights plus prayer is a good combination to sustain marriage. Well, I was just going to ask you this, and maybe that, that was the answer, but um, what are some of the things when you look at, at healthy and strong marriages, what are some of the characteristics um, of, of those couples? Uh, well, definitely a Christ-centered marriage, a yeah. vibrant prayer life, going to Mass together, like I say, getting on your knees and asking your spouse, what is it that I should be storming heaven for on, mm. on, on your mm. behalf? Yeah. And each of them knowing what is in the... It would just be great if anybody is watching this show, ask yourself, do you know what your spouse wants from God right now? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know in your heart what it is that they're asking? And if not, ask them today and ask them every morning. And when you return at home and you see each other again, I've been praying to God for you for this and yes. how's this going? So that that's yeah. that's a, then then the other date nights. It's amazing, you know. You see some of these studies that come out just of going on fun date nights. Yes. Like I said, sometimes it could just be done at home, but we try to make them something that you can't organize on your own, like having a priest available to celebrate mass for married couples. That's or awesome. An Oktoberfest where you're doing beer tasting and then all of a sudden you're square dancing together and you're at this mass. Is, this is, I think, it's huge. So important because as you describe. You know some of the ideals. You know, I, I'm thinking I fall short of practically every one of those. You know, <laughs> I've got a lot of room for growth. You know, on the other hand, when you described how it is that all this time was spent in marriage preparation or in annulments, you know, our own practical experience in corporate business. You know, you would never focus your factory upon job interviews and unemployment benefits. You know, you'd focus on on job on the job training. You know, so that as people become, you know, uh, habituated to their work, you want to give them new skills, you know, and, and I think that's what this is doing. Perhaps because it's so sacred, we wouldn't apply practical common sense to it. We would just kind of leave that to the realm of the religious, but all the more, because it is not just a contract, but a covenant and a sacrament, these practical things are needed. But I want to insert one other suggestion, and that is frequent confession, mm. you know, because as you describe these things, I'm like, Lord, do I have anything to add? You know, well, yeah, confession. You know, yeah. because I, I really believe that after more than three decades of being a Catholic, going to that sacrament on a regular basis renews my covenant with the bridegroom and puts me back in the church as bride. And I, I just think that in our marriage and in our family with the kids as well, frequent confession has been a lifeline. Without which we. I don't know what we would be. Yeah, the medicine of, of mercy. mercy yeah. Yeah. Uh, somebody once said that uh, marriage was invented so that men might realize that uh, they really do have problems. They have <laughs> faults, failings, because their wives are, are pretty uh, uh, good at spotting them, you know, even from a great distance. And success in that marriage, I, I think, is impossible in the absence of, of sorrow, uh, contrition. That, that silly movie, uh, Love Story, where, where the character says love is never having to say you're sorry, that's absolute Tommy rot. You always have to say you're sorry. You live that marriage on your knees, prostrate, right. uh, before a set of ideals that you can't, you can't meet, but you aspire to. It's a work in progress. Right. And success really depends on an intensity of attention. Mm. Uh, every moment, uh, every day, uh, until you, you carry it right to the edge of doom. Uh, and maybe you wake up and you realize, my God, I'm a saint. Yeah. And the third, the third, you'd say, okay, prayer and having God at the center of your marriage, frequent date nights. The third is God's first advice to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> so, yes. There we go. To me, one of the things that is just such a gift is John Paul II's teaching of the theology of the body. From that comes so natural, what we always hear today, it's called natural family planning. Right. I would call it organic sex. My brother says <laughs> that's having sex without the goalies. Uh. And so you start to realize that what's going on here is our bodies, yeah. especially in the marriage covenant, were created to 
to really bring forth the life mm -hmm. of ourselves to the other and to be mm -hmm. able to exchange that yeah. the way God created us with the mindset that I am here to make sure that my wife or uh, husband and wife exchange each other so that the other one realizes that the climax of that beautiful act. Yeah. Dr. Hahn, I remember when I was in seminary, he said, sex isn't good, sex isn't great, sex is holy. Yeah, exactly. Amen to that, yeah, because yeah. organic sex is all about allowing God's fruitfulness. Non-GMO. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It, 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 so it's incredible how uh, by, ha by allowing the Lord's rhythm at which the woman's body ticks right, to yeah. be the way in which the couple comes together is beautiful. I have a cousin who married a baseball pitcher. He uh, pitches for the Seattle Mariners now. And the two of them are in what they call the couples to couples leagues, which yes. are couples helping other couples to be able to live that intimacy in marriage at the pace, at the cadence of the woman's body. Yeah. Uh -huh. And when man mans up to say, I need to protect, venerate, and truly live my marriage life at the cadence of my wife, mm. it sets such a beautiful tone for marriage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, it's and God's rhythm. It is. Yeah. It's yeah. God's yeah. rhythm. It's, yeah. it, it is. And it's not possible without communication. You need to know That's about right. this inner syntax. Correct. You, you can't be oblivious to it, but you can't be ignorant of it. And you can't be grossed out by it either. No, no, you this can't. This is your dear wife. Right, yeah. right. You yeah. should be. You know, there's a, there's a lovely uh, song by Leonard Cohen. He died uh, a year or so ago called Dance Me to the End of love. And one line uh, uh, struck me by what you were saying, dance me to the children who are waiting to be born. Mm. I mean, it is a kind of dance, a solemn, sacred dance, and the rhythm has to be respected. You know, there are so many children God would like us to somehow participate in making be. And if we don't, they don't exist. They don't happen. Yeah. I mean, being fruitful is part of uh, uh, the marriage uh, experience, but also it's forever. I mean, that, I think, is the sticking point. I mean, having babies, uh, that just sort of happens. But knowing that you've got to do this forever, you're, you have to endure this, uh, celebrate this forever. I, I think for a lot of people, that's really, uh, that's really the challenge, because everything else is finite. There's no statute of limitations on a marriage. Yeah. Yeah. You have to carry one another into the kingdom of heaven. That's powerful. That's powerful. <laughs> well, uh, stay with us for the final segment of Franciscan University Presents. Our faith plays a huge role, probably the most important role in our marriage. Um, praying together, going to Mass together. I do a holy hour with John each week, and that has really helped uh, build our marriage on Christ. I think it's huge for us to be able to set an example for our kids. I think we see that over and over again, that our kids will do what we choose to do. And so by showing them an example uh, of a mother and father who prays and who attends daily Mass, I can tell them that those are important things and that they should do the same. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy. And you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily Mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. You don't have to trade top flight academic programs for a passionately Catholic identity. You can have both. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll not only deepen your faith, you'll be prepared for real world success by dedicated professors for whom excellence isn't just a goal, but the standard. Ready to get started? Check out franciscan.edu. Welcome to the final segment of Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking about marriage. Um, Bridges, could you start us off? Yeah, uh, Father, thank you so much uh, for coming and for everything uh, that you've said. Uh, I'm really struck by how winning uh, your style is uh, and, and how full of wisdom, uh, grace, uh, and truth. Uh, and your, your remarks uh, seem to me to be a source of, of great comfort uh, and insight, and I, I trust our viewers will be suitably uh, edified and uh, galvanized to try and make their marriages better. Mm -hmm. uh, Chesterton has a great line. He describes marriage as an adventure like going to war. 
Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's a wonderful irony, sort of like the irony of a celibate priest uh, saying wonderful things about uh, sex. I mean, you and Carol Vatiwa uh, had that facility, uh, and you're in good company. But I think what Chesterton means is, it is like going to war, but you're on the same side. You're not at each other's uh, throat. Uh, and it's a struggle, it's a drama, it's a conflict, and sometimes it assumes titanic proportions, because it's against powers and principalities, finally. The agent of disorder is the devil, and he's determined to destroy marriage, because that's the key, I, I think, for winning the war. Uh, and we can't succumb, we have to fight against him, but we fight together. And we fight in the trenches. And that's what makes the Catholic imagination, I, I think, uh, uh, so liberating, so salutary. Because it doesn't force me to imagine that at the end of the day, I have to let go of all this stuff. And with a kind of indecent haste, I rush into the arms of God. Mm -hmm. The Catholic imagination invites me to carry everything with me, all this baggage, flesh and bone and and brain, uh, all of that, and get it baptized, sanctified, and carry it with me into the heart of the unimaginable other, God himself. Which means, if I'm going to make it, if I'm saved, it will not be in spite of my wife, but because of her. We mm -hmm. save each other. Uh, we minister to one another. It, it's not, it's not, uh, f it's not accidental that the couple confect the marriage. They consummate it. And, and so they also confect each other's salvation uh, in cooperation with his grace. And there's always plenty of it. And I'm, I'm so encouraged by this ministry because you're trying to highlight the importance of recourse to grace, to God, to prayer, uh, to the Mass. And that has to work. Yeah. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Scott. Yeah, I also, I also want to thank you for the pastoral wisdom. And I'm grateful that you were the pastor at St. Simon and Jude. Mm -hmm. uh, they're my patron saints. I was born on their feast day <laughs> when I wasn't even Catholic, you know. And of course, Simon is a zealot and Jude is the patron of lost causes. And you are a zealot. Uh, you are zealous for marriage. And a lot of people think of it as a lost cause. And it's not. You know, I remember coming to Steubenville as an employee professor more than a quarter of a century ago and hearing Father Benedict Rochelle address a tent full of high school kids. And it was entertaining until one point he just said, I predict that in 50 years I won't be here, but all of you will practically, but nothing we all know will be here except the church and the sacraments. I remember thinking, what a woeful prediction, what a dire statement for high school kids. But I think he was right. But I think if he is right, it is not a dire prediction. It's a message of hope because if all that's left is the church and the sacraments, that's really all we need. Marriage, the Eucharist, confession, and all the others too. But I, I think you are onto something. You know, the sacrament doesn't make it easy. The sacrament is what makes it possible. And it's also what makes it salvific. You know, nothing in my life experience has been greater frustration than marriage. Nearly 40 years into it, nothing has been more fulfilling than marriage, and the fulfillment surpasses the frustration 100 to 1. And yet there's still frustration, you know, and there's still the need to renew the covenant and the graces and all of that. And so I sense that your zeal, plus the practicalities of the renew, the I do, the date nights, the prayer, the Eucharist, the plain and ordinary things that are invested with the extraordinary grace. I mean, this is the path of pedestrians who want to get to heaven and become saints. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Father James. Uh, true. You know, my dear grandfather, he, he uh, said to his wife on his 50th anniversary, the only time I didn't love you was before I knew you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's something about that, uh, romantic. that romantic way of looking at a bride after 50 years and still say that. And he, he would be the first to admit the only reason why he can say that is because of God's grace. Mm. At St. Bede's Church in Pittsburgh, they got married just after Christmas. And what happens there? You have the words of your vows, and then you have the action of the consummation. And so there it is, words and deeds built on God's grace. That's the fundamental building block to a successful family. And mm. I'm so grateful to God that my vocation as a priest is one in which when I see the bride coming down with her dear father, I ask myself, do I love the church as much as this dear groom loves this bride right now? Yeah. Uh -huh. And so the first thing that ha comes to me when I think of Renew the I Do is my own priesthood. 
and renewing my I do. Mm. And when I see married couples, whether they're in a difficult state or in a state of bliss, it's all the same. It's to me, it's what can Jesus Christ, what can God's grace, how can that through their sacramental love be, uh, be transmitted? And so one of the things that to me for Renew the I Do, that, which I hope people can, can take home with them today, is to get out your love maps and see how God's will brought you together Talk about the stories that brought you together. Talk about those things, that moment when perhaps your dear husband got on his knees and, and asked for your hand in marriage. And then think back to the scriptures and the church and in that moment in which you got married. And then think back to those different moments where you thought, oh, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And then all of a sudden, maybe it was a prayer, maybe it was a smile, maybe it was a twinkle and something. But to recognize that God loves you so much more than you can possibly imagine. Mm. That if his plan for you is to get married, it's not going to be just to survive. It's going to thrive. Mm. And so, Renew the I Do is just trying to be out there to cheer married couples on. <laughs> As a priest, I would do anything I could to help our marriages survive, not just a little bit, but to thrive in joy because your children deserve it, our church deserves it, your spouse deserves it. And Jesus Christ on the cross giving himself completely has placed his whole divinity out there so that your marriage can plug in to the great grace of the sacrament of marriage. Amen, amen. Thank you, Father Jay. Um, if you've enjoyed today's program, we're gonna have a, uh, a handout for you at faithandreason.com uh, to go deeper in marriage and to get some great principles for you or for you to share, uh, or just for calling us, we'll, we'll, we'll send it off to you. Um, as we look at this, you know, it was, it was a year ago that we had the 100th anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima, who in the secret said that at the final battles uh, uh, with Satan will be over marriage and family. Uh, your marriage matters, and Satan knows it maybe sometimes better than we do. We need to fight for our marriages and realize that we're part of a cosmic struggle, even though it's the small little things. Uh, Kimberly would often say she's changing the world one diaper at a time. Um, you know, and it's, and it's through these small little gifts of love in our marriage uh, that's going to help renew and restore the order that our society is longing for. Some, sometimes we think we can get too caught up in the big picture and we forget the small things that are right in front of us that we really can influence and we can really control. So, so recognize that you're in this battle and then go to your knees uh, as a couple. Uh, as, as my wife and I have been married uh, 20 some odd years, um, we've been through many struggles with our kids, but when we have that united front together in prayer, it makes all the difference in the world. It's, it's that, that uh, tapping into a, our sacramental grace. This is a grace for us, and that's how we parent, that's how we live and love each other, because uh, we can do nothing apart from, from Christ. And that's what that sacrament's there for. Do we renew uh, the, the grace of that sacrament in our daily lives? And then are we building community? Are we looking for other couples through uh, renew the I do, through others that you can really strengthen your own marriages and marriages throughout our world. Um, I want to invite you to be a part of Franciscan University's mission. We want to educate, to evangelize, and send forth joyful disciples. So come and be a part of our, our uh, program here at the university, studying and earning your degree or through our online programs. Join us at our dynamic and, and really life-changing summer conferences or travel with us on the sacred uh, and beautiful pilgrimages around the world. Or go to faithandreason.com to be equipped for the new evangelization. Uh, Father, could you close us with your blessing? Yes, and I think we should also ask St. Rita to pray for us, patron saint of matrimony. Yes. Uh, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon us and remain with us forever. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357.